Okay. Good day, students. So we will be discussing Unit 1, which is the self from various perspectives. In our elementary and now high school and college life, we are often welcome to the idea of Johari's window. So Johari window would tell us that there are parts of ourselves which could be known to others and known to ourselves. We call that as the open self. We also have the blind self, which is unknown to the self, but known to others. So this is the type of self that others could see. We also have the hidden self, the information about who we are that we tend not to share with other people, and definitely the unknown self, something that we do not know of, we could not share that. So for this particular unit, instead of looking into the different or the four quadrants of the self, we would be discussing the different perspectives, meaning understanding of who we are from the different perspectives. So since it's very difficult to find who we are, it's like a question mark that we keep on punching that Eventually, hopefully, we could win. So for this particular unit, we will be discussing the self from the philosophical perspective. We also have the psychological perspective, the social, uh, sociological perspective, anthropological perspective, as well as the collectivist and the individualist perspective. Okay. We will discuss these perspectives and their contribution to understanding ourselves. So please take note, this would be a very long lecture. Okay, let's start with the philosophical perspective. So the main thing that philosophers would like to tell us is that they would like to answer the question, who are we? So who are you? Meaning it pertains to the consciousness of the individual the identity of the individual and the self. So our lecture would summarize, would be summarized, or it is summarized using this particular uh, screenshot of the different ideas shared by 10 philosophers. So for Socrates, Plato, and St. Augustine, they believe that the self is a an immortal soul, which exists over time. So the self is equated to the soul. For Descartes, he believes that the self is the thinking self, meaning our self would be the part that thinks which is different from the body. Next, for John Locke, he said that identity, the personal identity of the self is equated to the different things that are happening to our consciousness. For David Hume, he proposes that, or he proposed that there is no self, but instead the idea of who we are would be merely perception, impression of the things that are happening in our mind. For Immanuel Kant, he said that the self is something that unifies, meaning it organizes the things that we are thinking based from our previous experiences, from the perception, from the things that we see, hear, taste, smell, and feel, to our, uh, to the organization of how we think about things. Uh, seven, seven, I guess, Sigmund Freud would tell us that the self is multi-layered, meaning there are different aspects and dimensions of the self. Whereas for Gilbert Rye, the self is the acting self. For Paul Churchland and his wife, he said that the self is equated to our brain. Whatever brain activity, it determines who we are. And lastly, for Maurice Merleau Ponty, he would say that the self is a subjective, a phenomenological consciousness and experience. So these are, or this would be the summary. Okay, For the philosophical perspective, this is quite a handful. There are a lot of things that we will be discussing, but hopefully 
As I summarize the point of view of our discussion, you'll have a guide of what to look forward to. Okay, so we'll start with Descartes uh, for Socrates. So Socrates believes in the saying that know thyself. So in Athens, there is this particular oracle, the oracle of Delphi, who would be seated in a, in a stool way higher than people who would listen or who would listen to her. So she would be conversing with prince, with kings, to tell them what would happen in the future. So the main thing here is the way that we're introducing this oracle tells us that in order for us to know who we are, which could contribute to how the progress of nation during ancient Greek time would prosper, it would depend upon the oracle's prediction. So for her, one of the things that people should do is to know who they are or to examine who they are. Okay, Why is this very, very important? Because the field of philosophy comes from two Greek words, philia, which means love, and sophia, which means wisdom. So for Greek philosophers or for the field of philosophy, here you're loving to get to know things, meaning in order to appreciate life, in order to appreciate who you are, you have to get information and have valid knowledge towards it. So getting information is not enough, but instead for the field of philosophy, the application of correct knowledge trying to understand the objects around us would be the main thing here. Okay, so that would be philosophy. Next. So for philosophy, what is the self? The self is that, like what we said, philosophy means love for wisdom or knowledge. Loving who we are means pursuing our knowledge about who we are. We do things not because it makes us happy, but it is really our quest toward, not towards knowledge. Okay. So for Socrates, the first philosopher that we will be discussing, he is guided by this dictum or advice, an examined life is not worth living. So for Socrates, he has to do Socratic method, a way of testing a certain idea wherein you ask a lot of questions so that you could build on knowledge on this particular idea. So a person, in order to understand the individual, the self of the individual, a person, according to Socrates, would have to keep on asking questions, testing, verifying, inquiry about that particular question. Okay. Another thing about Socrates' idea about the self is that the self, like what I've said, is equated to the soul, wherein the soul is something which is immortal. When our body dies, when we die, it lives. Okay, clear? So the main thing that the soul would like to pursue is the virtue of happiness. So the real self is not equated to your body, but instead it is equated to the soul. The soul would keep on prospering, would keep on attaining happiness because it would improve the life of the individual. Okay, so those are things you have to remember. So for Socrates, other things that you have to look into the dichotomy between the self, the body, and the soul, I should say, would be the visible existence, something that we see, the body, the invisible ex existence, which will be the mind of the individual. So he said that when the soul and body are together, nature assigns our body to be a slave and to be ruled and the soul to be the ruler, ruler and master. He believed that the goal of life is to be happy. Virtuous man is a happy man and that virtue alone is the one and only supreme God that will secure his or her uh, supreme good that will secure his or her happiness. So for Socrates, he would say that there are different virtues like courage, self-control, friendship, our relationship with others, piety, how we care for other people, 
this will nourish the soul so that it could attain happiness. So for the self, the self may be composed of body and soul, but the body is merely a servant of the soul, meaning the body serves the soul so that the soul could reach its happiness. Okay. So in the nutshell, for Socrates, he said that the self is something that we try to discover. That's why he said, I know that I know nothing. The first instance of having knowledge, quest towards knowledge, is admitting to ourselves that we do not know anything. But keeping ourselves ignorant of information, of knowledge, is an evil action. So the virtue here is that an individual, in order to reach happiness, has to search for knowledge about who it is. And the main ideal life is to be happy. Sabi nga ni si Senator Enrile, gusto ko happy ka. Parang ganon si Socrates. Okay. So next philosopher would be Plato. So for Plato, he's one of the disciples of Socrates. He focused on the collection and division. So in order to understand things, not merely inquiring the Socrates method, but for Plato, he introduced the term collection and division. So let me read. In this method, the philosopher would collect all the generic ideas that seem to be common, characteristic, and divide them into different kinds until subdivision of ideas become specific. This will tell us that we gather information about the world, though the physical world is not real, but instead it's merely a reflection of the ideal one. Okay, so this is quite a famous thing that we have to remember. So for Plato, his idea, the real thing, is something which is outside of the individual. It could not be seen. But we may have a concept of it. How are we able to understand this concept? Through the different experiences that we have. That as we try to dissect and try to categorize this, we will have an idea of what concept we're thinking. Example, in this illustration, the idea of beautiful is something which is not really known in the physical world. How do we have this concept? It's within our soul. It's within our mind. We gather information. We try to collect information and try to distinguish them, categorize them so that we will have a concrete idea of what is beautiful. Okay. So you have to remember for Socrates that there are three divisions of the soul. The first one would be the appetitive, which is the sensual, meaning it's the physical, the passion thing, the senses, sense, senses, experiences, sensory experiences. Whereas the rational would be the thinking part. This would be the deciding one, whether a person would enjoy the sensory experience or would be governed by the spirited, which is the feeling. You could deal with the demand, the passion, or the victory. Okay. So for, like what I was saying, the theory of forms, for Plato, he said that ideas about things is like the cave. What we see are merely shadows and reflections of what is happening in the cave. So our idea, for example, of beautiful is merely a reflection of what is the real form of beauty. Okay. And there could be some people who would manipulate this particular perception. So in the nutshell, for, Socrates, uh, for Plato, wisdom could lead us to happiness. Wisdom could lead us to wisdom could lead us to happiness. Um, the soul, the self is divided into three: the appetitive, the spirited, as well as the rational. And the main aim here is that for the individual to use his rational thoughts. Okay, next. So for St. Augustine, like Socrates and Plato, they also equate the self with the soul. 
But the main point of view of St. Augustine is that for the soul, the self is the immaterial soul, but it comes from a Christian perspective, meaning human being is both a soul and body. The body possesses the senses through the soul, through the soul, through which the soul experiences the world. However, he recognizes that the soul and the self is as a whole. No one is a slave, but instead we are guided by a soul. So humans, as we try to conquest, try to conquer who we are, is meant to have higher divine and heavenly matters that will compensate his comprehension of the mind. Meaning our main aim, unlike Socrates and Plato, would not be happiness, but instead doing what God appoints us what to do. So the ultimate aim of the soul is to be reunited with God through doing his actions. Okay, so we do not have the forms like Plato. We do not have the questioning like Socrates. But for St. Augustine, he would say that in order for us to know who we are, we should, we should commune with God through our religion so that we could realize the potential of our soul. Okay, next, another philosopher would be Rene Descartes. So for Descartes, Remember the soul and the mind? For the first three philosophers, they are reunited. One may be higher over the other or they are equal. But for René Descartes, he would say that the soul, or sorry, the mind of the individual, the dichotomy of the mind and the body is very distinct. The main principle that René Descartes uses would be doubt. Everything that he sees Everything that he thinks, he is doubtful about. That's why he have this mythological skepticism, meaning a systematic process of being skeptical, skeptical about the truth on one's belief in order to determine which belief could be as certain as true. His main dictum is, I think, therefore I am. So everything that we know passes through our senses, but through our thinking, it could be a determinant of the real who we are. Because according to his statement, everything perceived by the senses could be used, could not be used as proof of existence as human senses can be full. So for Socrates, everything that we do can be doubted. He claimed that, he, these are his claim about the self. So it is constant. Our perception may change, but our idea of the self does not change. It is not affected by the body. Only the immortal soul remains the same throughout time. And the immaterial soul is the source of our identity. Okay. So like what I've said, there's a dichotomy between the soul and the body. The body would be something like in Plato, something which is inferior over the uh, inferior to the soul of the individual. Okay. That's why if you talk about the irony of life of Descartes, he died because of illness. He does not think and give importance to his body, but instead he focuses on the soul, the thinking part, because this is the important thing in order to know who we are. We also have here John Locke. So for John Locke, he is a philosopher, physician, and one of the most influential enlightenment thinkers. So for him, the self includes memories of the thing, thinking thing. This includes memory, enables him to identify who he is over time. So it's our memory that defines who we are. The state of the person who cannot remember his behavior is the same state of a person who never committed an act, which means that a person is ignorant. A good question for, okay, next. We also have David Hume. 
So for David Hume, compared to others, we do not have any self. Because for him, he believed that all knowledge comes from our experiences. But this bundle or collection of perception could have a fast transition of impressions and ideas. So when we say impression, these are things that have a great impact towards us, like maybe important events in your life, traumatic events, positive events, people that had influenced you. For us, ideas are copied and reproduced sense data, meaning this would be the information that would retain in our mind. Since our perception keeps on changing, our impression also changes, our ideas also change. That's why the idea of who we are keeps on changing. Thus, there is no sense of self. Next, for Sigmund Freud, he said that the self is multi-layered. So there are three layers, the conscious, the preconscious, and the unconscious. This is a simple thing. So in our mind, in our mind, conscious would be the things that our senses could experience. Like for example, your awareness of what you are listening at the moment. Your awareness of the things that are, that you are seeing at the moment. Preconscious would be data within ourselves that had been part of our memory. Like for example, you hear me asking you the question who you are, conscious. The information of your name is a preconscious or a subconscious. It is part of your memory. And the most uh, controversial part of the multi-layered part of the self is the unconscious. These are collection of information that the person is not aware of. It had happened in the past or it is part of the things that are already in the mind of the individual. So he said that the self is also influenced by the unconscious mind. To better illustrate this, I guess you are familiar with the iceberg. So the conscious, our thoughts and perception, subconscious, the memories, the knowledge that we store in our mind, and the unconscious. This could be fears that we tend to forget that had happened in the past. The motives that we have, particularly if we talk about motives, it will deal with unacceptable sexual desires like the oral, the anal, and the rest, or in the family. Then the irrational wishes, the immoral urges, shameful experiences, and selfish needs. Okay. Sometimes students would come to us and say, Mom is the unconscious evil. Actually, no. It is just that it's like the animal instinct that we have. The fear, the initial fear that we have when we are faced with situation. That's why we, we are able to survive, survive as a race. Okay. So we also have here the id, ego, and superego, which I will discuss in the psychological perspective. So id, ego, and superego. Next. So, okay, let me discuss it then. So for the id's ego and superego, here's what you have to remember. The id is something that operates in the pleasure principle, meaning everything that the id does is always towards pleasure. It is an instinct to preserve our life, to have a good food, to have to fulfill our desires. That's id. However, as we operate in our world, as we grow older, some demands of the society would be present. Like for example, how should you conduct in the society or community? Those are the norms, the rules, obligations, the responsibility. That is the super ego. Okay. When id and ego clashes or clash, it would Eid and superego would clash, it would be the ego that will tend to look at reality and decide which should, what should be done. Should I, the ego would say, should I follow the id 
or the ego would say, should I follow the super ego? So it depends upon the individual. Okay. So super ego consists of the conscience and the idea. So, okay. Now, Immanuel Kant. So let me read because this is quite challenging to explain. Immanuel Kant, respect for the self. So man is the only creature who governs and directs himself and his action, who sets up and uh, who sets up and for himself and his purpose, and who freely orders means for the attainment of his aims. Every man is thus, thus an end in himself and should be treated as a means, a plain dictum reason and justice. Respect others as you respect yourself. A person should not be used as a tool, instrument, device to accomplish another's private end. Treat everyone equally. Our rational, rationality unifies and makes sense of the perceptions that we have in our experiences and makes sensible ideas about ourselves and the world. So what you have to remember here is that for Immanuel Kant, the self is something that uses the senses, the perception, the thinking in order to define who he is. But the main emphasis is that the self, the improvement of the self is the main aim. It's the end. Whereas the means toward receiving going to that end is to respect oneself. The morality, it's the reason. So in a nutshell, for Immanuel Kant, it's the reasoning that defines who we are, particularly how we deal with what is right or wrong. There is the inner self, which includes rational reasoning or psychological state, and the outer self, which includes the body, the physical mind, which where representation occurs. But the real self would be the rational self. Okay, next. So for example, so how does the self operate? So the intellect operates with idea. The mind operates with prior forms or categories. So if the person experiences a certain sensation, like seeing an object, this would be process in the intellect. What is that object? process in the mind what experiences had I had in the past. And that's how you're able to synthesize the experiences or the sensory experiences that you are experiencing. Okay. For Gilbert Rye, he said that I act, therefore I am. You are what you do. So the concept of the self is that the actions that you do would be that description of who you are. People would say, you are a good person. How would they say that? It would be through your actions. How you're able to express the idea of being a good person. How are you able to help other people in order to exemplify being a good person? So it's the action that determines who we are. So I act, therefore I am. Okay. For Maurice Merleau-Ponty, the self is a subjective one. It depends upon the experience of the self. Okay, so the idea here is that it's not the thinking. It's not the categories that we have in about ourselves because it would be the experience of the self. So you would say that I am a strong person if you had experienced some traumatic experiences or events in your life that you're able to overcome. There. Okay. Next. So, for example, we may be looking at this particular figures, but we have different experiences. For example, this is almost the same figure. But it depends upon our perspective. We could look at it as expansion if it will be the upper figure. It could be a contraction if it will be the lower figure. So it depends upon our perspective. And lastly, Paul and Patricia Kirtland, Churchland. So for them, 
it's the brain that determines who you are. They pioneer neuroscience wherein they try to understand how the brain works. It would be through MRs, MRI scan or CT scan that they are able to identify what is the self. Okay, so those are the things. Now, let's go to the psychological perspective of the self. So for psychological, it relates to psychology would deal with uh, the study of the mind, how it operates, and how it affects the behavior. Okay, so it will describe the mental processes, the emotional processes, or the cognitive processes. So psyche came from, psychology came from two Greek words, psyche, which means the mind, or for philosophers, they emphasize on the soul, and logos, like biology, study. So study of the mind. But for the Greek philosophers, since if you will define psychology as the study of the mind, it's very difficult to see what is in the mind. That's why nowadays we say that psychology is the study of mental processes so that we can objectively define it and behaviors. Okay, so let's start with William James. So the self is the normal waking consciousness of the individual. So the self-identity of an individual depends upon the things that are happening while he is awake, while he is conscious, while he is thinking of those different information. Okay, so for William James, he is able to define the self into two ways, the me-self and the I-self. So for the I-self, this is the thinking self. It reflects the soul of the person or the mind, purely ego. Whereas the me-self is the empirical, it is the observable experience of the individual. For example, in chapter 2, we will be discussing the material self, the social self, the, the spiritual self. So your appearance, physical self, defines the me-self. Whereas the I-self defines the idea of who you are. Okay, Next. So our self-concept could be influenced by, first, our self-image. How do we see ourselves? Even our ideal self, what would be my oath to be self? And our self-esteem, which is our evaluation of, evaluation of the self based from the opinions of other people, particularly significant individuals. Okay. So we have another psychologist, Carl Rogers. So he said, self-concept is, another, is another important aspect of understanding the self, which is the self-image. He de defines self as flexible, changing perception of personal identity. Why changing? Because the self moves toward self-fulfillment and actualization. How would we reach actualization or fulfillment if we're able to satisfy the needs that we have? Okay, so for example, for Carl Rogers, he said that there are two, like William James, there are two aspects, the me and the I self. For him, we have the ideal and the real self. If the ideal and the real self are congruent, then that's the time wherein a person may experience fulfillment, a person may realize his potential and his actions. Okay, so sometimes because the ideal self is not equated to the real self, then there are some ways in order for us to understand this. So sometimes, like in the age of adolescence, there are things that seems to be inconsistent since you're searching for your identity, who you are. Your ideal self may not be the same with what you are at the moment. There is a need to unify the ideal self with the ought to be self. Okay. For Bandura, the self is proactive and agentic. When we say agency, the individual has the capacity to define who he is. So it's rather a way of not merely getting the information and, get, and let this information define who we are. But instead, it's the person's ability, how he would look into his 
belief system, regulatory capabilities to define who is. And this is influenced by intentionality, forethought, reactiveness, and reflectiveness. Okay, so let's try to discuss Bandura. So for him, our behavior is influenced by the person and the environment. So the person may have cognitive abilities, physical characteristics, beliefs, and attitude. The environment may stimulate different contexts like the physical surroundings, the social relationship, and other influences that could motivate a person to do an action. Example, if the person is highly intellectual, cognitive ability, magaling siya sa math, and then he has good features, then the behavior that may be exemplified is that he may be trained in math. That's why he's good in math. Okay, nagigets niyo? Okay, so it's the individual which will determine together with the environment, the self, the definition of the self. Okay. Next, for Bandura also, he focuses on social learning theory wherein we learn by observing other people. First process is that there's attention, retention, motor reproduction, and motivation. So by following other people, we are able to define who we are. So intentionality for thought. Okay, Sigmund Freud, this is the id, ego, superego that we had discussed. And he focuses on the different uh, psychosexual development theories, like the oral self, the anal self, the phallic stage, latency stage, and the genital stage. Hmm, na discuss But let me just give you. So for him, like Sigmund Freud had said, the personality of the individual depends upon how he is able to satisfy the id, satisfy the ego, superego, with the help of the ego. So during oral stage, stage, the pleasure center would be the mouth area. So everything the child does would be through, or everything the child does would be towards the, the satisfaction of the mouth area. That's why they nail bite or they suck they cry because this is the pleasure center. So if the individual will not be able to satisfy or overly satisfy, we call that as fixation, then he may have an oral personality. Okay, for example, ang sabi ni Sigmund Freud, pag yung isang tao, madaldal, marites. Si Mare, ano ang pinaka-latest? So he may be experiencing a fixation over satisfaction, under satisfaction of the oral stage. Whereas for the anal stage, you will not pleasure the anus, but instead elimination of body waste. So if you are trained properly, not too strict, not, not too lax, then you may have a normal childhood, normal personality according to Sigmund Freud. I'm, I'm smiling because this is quite um, controversial. So for the anal stage, if you will have fixation, overly satisfied, underly satisfied, then you may have to develop a personality or a type of self wherein you're very obsessive compulsive. Everything should be perfect or sometimes disorganized the opposite. The phallic stage would be focuses on, it focuses on the genitals, the sexual urges, the pleasure center would be the different genitals for the males and the females. Wait and see, quiet stage, and then go back again. That's why for a male, genital stage, the last one, for the males, it's expected that they are attracted to the females because the females or the males have something that the females do not have. So that's the idea of Sigmund. Okay. Next, we have also Eric Erikson, psychoso uh, psychosocial development theory, wherein in each stage, there would be two crises. So for infant, that would be trust versus mistrust. So as an infant, when you cry, you would like your care caregiver to immediately attend to your needs so that you could depend on them. You could hope that they will give you something and uh, help you relax or maybe be able to be fed. Okay, that is developing trust. But if you cried and cried, no one would come to your aid. 
then you would say, ah, I could not trust anyone. It's just as simple as that would be the thing. Okay. Next. So for Abraham Maslow, like Carl Rogers, he focuses on the self-actualization. Okay. So the self would be a self that will have to focus on the different needs. Can you still remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs wherein there would be the physiological needs at the bottom, followed by the safety needs. Then you have the esteem needs, the cognitive needs, as, and lastly, the self actualization Okay, next, sociological perspective. So for social, this is another perspective. It is the study of the social life, social change, social causes that would have consequences on human behavior. So the idea of the self is not only defined by the individual, unlike philosophical and psychological perspective, but it is a product of social experience, how we deal with other people. So our identity, our self, is influenced by our culture, how we interact with others, how we socialize with the world, meaning what kind of relationship we have, with our parents, our classmates, and our teachers, or even our small groups, social groups, or institutional groups. Formal, like for example, the club that you belong to, or institution like here in the Philippines, a prominent institution would be the political institution, maybe the personality that you have may depend upon or your choice of the political presidential candidate may depend upon what you like, what you feel to be the most um, ideal or deserving candidate to win the presidential election. That's why we have the BDS, <laughs> Ding Tong Dantes, but no. uh, BDS, the Lenny Group, the Bong Bong Marcos, those different things. Those are political institutions. Okay? So we are able to define who we are because we acquire these modes of thinking, feeling, and acting through our participation in the community. Our social identities would be internalized values and rules that we have as we interact with the world. That is why socialization is the process by which society transmits its cultural value not implanting them in the mind of the individual, but instead through interaction and internalization of behavior, concept, knowledge, and skills that are essential for social living. So we will discuss different theories such as by different sociologists, Cooley, the looking glass self, and George Herbert Mead, the social self. Okay, so the looking glass self is the self depends upon how other people see us. So the definition of who we are depends upon how other people see us. So like in the illustration, I am who I am depending upon how my girlfriend would see me. Maybe my father would say, I'm a good boy. Maybe my ex-girlfriend would say, I'm, a, I'm rather an evil individual. Can't be ex-girlfriend. Okay, next. So for the looking glass self, you define who you are depending upon the reaction or the impression of other people. You would not say to yourself and then pat your shoulder or your back saying, I'm good in math. You're able to know that you're good in math because your teacher says so. Your score, which is your score, the result of your exam, which is evaluated by your teacher, verifies your idea that you are good in Next, so it's also our social norms. If you have already watched Moana, one of the Disney movies, it tells us how our norms define who we are. Remember, Moana is one of the leaders in their tribe, and there is a great expectation of her since she would be the next ruler. That's why she has to do things according to their custom. But since this is self-discovery, this is a movie on self-discovery, he tried to search for who he, are, who he is, who she is. But eventually, as she discovered who she is, she's able to find that it's her community, the past 
experiences of her community that defines who she is. Okay. Herbert, uh, George Herbert Mead theories that the self is social. It is developed through social experiences. And there are different stages. The first stage would be the preparatory stage. Children imitate people around them. They follow their parents. They follow their caregiver. Then next would be the play stage. Children develop skills in order to communicate with symbols through role-playing or through games. Until such time, they are able to form groups so that they could actively perform a task, which is to win as a group and have a good relationship with their group members. So our idea of who we are starts with preparatory, play stage, and then lastly, the game stage. Okay, so it would be our language, language that would have great impact to the development of the self. Okay, as we start with the preparatory stage, the words that we form would help us interact with other people. That's why when a child or a baby would say, dada, papa, mama, this is a language. In order to communicate, the words that he formed would be ways to communicate with his parents and there would be an interaction, which is the reaction of the parents on the statement of the child. So the child, through symbols, gestures, words and sound is able to communicate. Remember, language is a means of communication. Communicate his needs, communicate his appreciation or reactions. And it is, and there is a feedback from the person where the communication is directed to. Okay, this is further developed through plays. Kaya nga napaka-importante ng play. Play would deal with how the person would Put, or the child would put himself in a certain situation or persona. Like for example, why is it that almost all of us have experienced doing role-playing of nanay-nanayan, tatay-tatayan, or bahay-bahayan? Those would be gender roles assigned to us. If you say, and you are born female, I'll say, ah, I'll be the mother. You are trying to play, role-play the different behaviors of the mother. Why? Because you're now aligning yourself to the actions of a mother or a family side. Okay, clear? I can be hand. Even in games, the planes, the games that we get involved to, the games that we like in our life defines who we are. Okay, like for example, kindergarten, a uh, kindergarten, Chinese garter when we were younger would define who we are. If your group would be merely composed of females, sa mga group ko ng babae, at medyo pa cute or pa demure ka, Chinese character. But if you're more attached to the males, you would like to be more of the running person, you will do the, ano ba yung game na yun? Uh, I forgot. Basta the running game or even sipa. Okay. So, for Joey, uh, for me, Joey, for me, Herbert Mead, he would say that there are two types of self. The I and the me. The I would be the meaning making, whereas the me would be the social or the performing. So what does this mean? It means us that if I is synonymous to me, then the full development of the self is a team. I would be the objective one, what I know of myself, whereas the me would be influenced by the society the society would you would act depending upon the role that the society attached to you. If there would be congruence, in pareha sila, then there was there would be development. Okay, so there are different agents of um, socialization: the media, the peers, the religion, the school, the technology. Okay, so another sociologist would be the Lanusa Gil uh, Baul Baul Rillard. Hmm. The self is a product of modern and postmodern society. So who we are is defined by our societies. That's why nowadays we have the I am a digital migrant or in you are the digital born. Meaning if you talk about technology, you could easily manipulate technology compared to digital migrants. Like us. Okay. So 
postmodern, modern. Now, he said that the idea of the self would be a consequence of prestige and status symbol. We are defined but by what we have. That's according to Jean or Jean. The postmodern modernity would focus on postmodernity would focus on the different demands that the society imposed to each individual. That's why to have a Gucci bag, to have a Versace bag is a prestigious. To have an iPhone, iPhone or any um, model, at latest model of phone would be a definition of who you are. Next, we also have the self in terms of its family. In the golden age, when we talk about family, it's the nu nuclear, meaning you have both parents, they love one another, that's why they gave birth to you. Now in the postmodern era, permeable family, wherein we now experience or we now observe single parents, or sometimes parents who are not married to one another, but they are raising the children together, or it could be a second family. Those could be different things. And they say that it has a great impact. That's why there is a certain study in, uh, sorry, there is, there is a certain study that focuses on the influence of OFW to the idea of family. That parents going abroad had really deteriorated our idea of a nuclear family. Now it becomes permeable. So what you have to remember for sociological would be coolest looking glass self needs the I, which is the subjective, the me, the objective. And Lanusa, it depends upon the society. And self-identity is achieved by symbols, one consumed by Gaudrillard. Gaudrillard. Okay. So another important aspect of the social self would be our community. How our community could, could influence who we are. Okay. How our community could influence who we are. No lie. Okay. Anthropological self. Uh, so we go to anthropology. It's how the study of human societies and cultures. So the study of humanity. Let me just move through it. What I would like to emphasize here is that it's our culture, particularly in Filipino, the sayings or mga kasabihan that would tend to define who we are. So meaning, for example, kung may si ang kumot, matutong mamulotot. Here, we are looking into a kasabihan, a saying that defines the Filipino culture or the Filipino idea of the self. Remember, for us Filipinos, we are machagain. We are matiisin. We tend to look for ways in order to improve, but at the moment, we have to bear with its negative consequences. So if we will try to explain kung may si ang kumot, matutong mamuluktot, hindi ibig sabihin yan, ayusin mo kasi yung pagkakatupin ng kumot. But instead, it gives us an idea of who, who Filipinos are. So there are three ways on how we deal with our culture. We either confront it, complain about it, and conform about it. Okay. Lastly, we have here the individualistic and the collectivist self. So for the individualistic self, this is first stipulated by Kitayama, Kitayama and company. So they say that in our society, the Western and the Eastern, Western, the US, the Europeans, Eastern, the Asian, the Africans, and the Latin Americans, there would be cultural nuances, cultural influences that determine who we are. Okay. As an individualistic, you define who you are as an independent individual. You look for uniqueness. You look for an identity. You look for something which is distinctly yours. Okay, clear? You define who you are by your own definition. Whereas for a collectivist society, you define who you are through other people or your different social networks. 
For example, we do not often say that I am Jacqueline Iglesias, period, no. But instead, you attach your social organization because we are in the collectivist. So you would say, I am Jacqueline Iglesias. I am from Nueva Vizcaya State University. Nueva Vizcaya State University would be a network, an institution where I belong. Okay, so those would be things you have to remember. You could read through it. It states here that there are different communities, not only one community. Most studies would focus on the United States, Canada area, but we could not define who we are as a community if we will merely look at the individualistic, because for the Filipinos, like the Japanese, the Puerto Ricans, the Africans, we belong in the collectivist society. Okay. So how are we motivated in the interdependence or the collectivist society? We are motivated through our common social goal. For us Filipinas, one of our goals would be to finish studies because it is a way to improve our life. This particular idea of improving our life would have a reference to what other expects us to do. How would you improve your life? Meaning, you do things because you would like to help your parents. So you're doing something, you're motivating to do something because of other people. For independent society, they would say, I would like to become successful. I, meaning, it's my own merit, it's my own capability. So those are things you have to remember. So when they care for a child, it's merely to develop the individual as a unique person. But for a collective society, to care for a child means to the child, to let the child be able to identify to his social organization. Okay, so there are different studies. That ends my presentation.